Welcome everyone to our ACEWARE session that's all about steps to take when preparing to open for online registration. ACEWARE technicians like Jason have been involved in all types of registration openings, including those that have a Black Friday type of opening with those all popular everyone wants them courses but limited seats available. So Jason has been through that and he has lots of lessons learned and tips for you today. So Jason, we are in your hands. Get us started. All right. Thank you, Sharon. So yes, we're talking about opening day and uh, I wanted to start this out with a show of hands. So let's, let's figure out of the people that we've got, it's kind of a small group today, but of the people that are here, are you opening day type A, which is just sort of casual, the people know when that day is going to be, and they've already kind of got an idea of what they're going to do, and there's not really any rush, or if you are type B, uh, raise your hands, and let's see if if any of you are this, this Black, Black Friday mad rush kind of crowd. All right, raise your hand. So Kimberly, I'm guessing you are the Black Friday type. Everyone come for limited seatings. Got your hand up and I'm assuming, let's, Kimberly, go ahead and uh, I'm gonna lower your hand and everybody else, raise your hand if you do that. Well, we're pretty prepared and there's not that big rush. Raise your hand there. I assume that's the rest of them. Okay, so you've got both here, Jason. Awesome. Well, the good news is that today we're going to talk about some tips and tricks that are going to be helpful for both types. But if you are type B, where you've got that mad rush of people, we're going to make sure that you have all the info you need to know to make sure that that launch goes as smooth as possible. Um, because some of the things that you you might take into consideration are even if you don't have that big uh, opening day launch where everyone is scrambling to get in, you know, that seat. These could be little mini rushes that coincide with um, when you release your digital or your print catalog, or if you've got a certain advertising or marketing campaign that just released. Uh, maybe it's a coupon that you you spread the word about. All of these can create uh, spikes in your enrollment activity, and we're going to talk about some of the things you can do today to be prepared for that. So a quick look at the agenda. We're first gonna talk about some of the server and uh, configuration options that you can choose that will maximize your ability to handle these large influx of traffic. Um, we're gonna talk about the difference between SQL and Visual Fox Pro. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the system requirements for AceWeb as well as running comm servers or file servers. We're going to look at having antivirus and firewall software playing nicely with your ACE web installation. We'll talk about software updates, both for your server as well as for your student manager and ACE web software. We're going to talk about debug logging. This is one that comes up quite a bit, which you want the benefits of logging, but you don't want it to hamper the actual functionality of your registration system. We'll talk about doing a little bit of pre-opening testing and then also about alerting your tech. After that, we're gonna do kind of a, a small review of getting your courses published. Some of the new features that we've added fairly recently um, and then just some, some other general tips for cloning your courses and getting those courses through their final checks and published to AceWeb. All right, so first off is the age old battle, SQL Server versus Visual Fox Pro. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? If your database size exceeds, if any table exceeds two gigabytes in size, then Fox Pro is immediately out. It just can't handle it. Now, the good news is that it would take a whole lot of records to reach that two gigabyte fi file size limit, because this isn't a limitation of the entire database size, but rather one table um, has a maximum of two gigabytes. So if you if you know that you've got a huge database and you have just exponential growth, then definitely consider SQL Server if you haven't already made that move already. Next up is number of users, so number of staff members accessing your software or student manager. If 
if you have a lot of users, more importantly, the more users you have, it exponentially weighs in the favor of SQL Server, especially with larger databases. If you have a lot of hands in the cookie jar, then SQL Server is going to be much more prepared to handle multiple people accessing your data, database at the same time. If you are one of the Ollie people or you have those huge bursts or spikes of enrollment, then SQL is typically going to be your best option here for super heavy online registration traffic. Um, the file-based system generally gets outperformed when you've got just thousands and thousands of hits on your ACE web server all occurring within a short period of time. Some other, other considerations are the ease of maintenance and administration. So with Visual Fox Pro, if we need to run some statements against your database or just do some kind of behind the scenes stuff, we can typically get in there and do that through, you know, the quote unquote magic box. And all we really need is someone that's got access to student manager, which is all of you guys. With SQL, it can get a little bit trickier. There's some things that have to be done through the SQL Server Management Studio, which is behind lock and key with your database administrator. Um, that's one of the other things to consider as well. With SQL Server, typically that's going to require um, access to not only the SQL Server installation, but to be able to borrow the time from your DBA to be able to run some of these commands um, every now and then. So the long story short is if you have access, if your main campus has a SQL installation that they will let you create a database in and borrow their DBA from time to time, that is typically your best situation. The licensing costs of having your own standalone SQL server can very quickly uh, get pretty outrageous. I'm, I think just the cheapest version is, uh, it's over $1,000 just to get started. Uh, the other thing that is kind of handy with SQL Server, you can, it's kind of a hands-off backup approach to where that is handled and can be scheduled by the SQL Server administrator. So they can set it to do nightly backups and you don't have that hassle of, you know, trying to scramble to get everyone out at the end of the day so that you can run the backup and make sure that it, you know, finishes completely. This is sort of a, uh, a more hands-off approach that you can put in someone else's hands. Um, now, I will say that there are still some, while well, all of your database files, so your name records and payments and all that are stored in SQL Server, and those do get backed up by your SQL backup, there are still some file-based things that need to be backed up uh, in your student manager folders, so keep that in mind. It's not a completely hands-off, but it's all of the really important stuff is hands-off in terms of the backup. Okay, so system requirements. This is something that you probably want to uh, make sure that you've talked with your IT and you have a, a hardware and a server operating system upgrade schedule, you know, laid out, some sort of a plan laid out so that it doesn't just get forgotten. And then you're, you know, three weeks away from your launch and you find out that you're still running server 2003 or something. Uh, make sure that you've got that upgrade schedule and you're kind of aware of what the system requirements are now, what your system specs are now, and if you need to consider upgrading. For a lot of places, this is this can be a fairly involved process. You know, it's got to go through a committee and then that has to be put on a schedule. And then you have to consider like budgets and fiscal years and uh, all of these things. So having this laid out as a, a planned schedule is typically your best bet. But right now for Ace Web, we recommend that you're running at least Windows Server 2019. Uh, you've got your .NET on the latest version and 16 gigabytes of RAM and four cores on your processor, at least two and a half gigahertz, which is, I mean, it's a pretty standard web server nowadays. A lot of these are typically going to be virtualized. So it's just a matter of your IT allocating, you know, that number of resources. Uh, CPU cores and memory to your virtual instance. So definitely keep that in mind uh, for performance, security, and obviously reliability. You don't want it to go breaking down at the worst possible times. Okay, next up is comm servers. So how many comm servers? Um, actually, let's talk about the difference between file 
mode and calm mode first. In a nutshell, calm mode typically beats out file mode uh, in terms of performance, um, redundancy, and just ease of, of setting up and making sure that if something happens and it goes down, if the server gets restarted, that those servers automatically load back up when someone hits one of your AWP pages. Calm mode typically wins out in all of those scenarios. We do have a, a few fringe cases where um, for whatever reasons, different technologies are involved and they have to be ran in file-based mode. Uh, the good news is that it's not a huge performance hit, but um, in our opinion, typically you're gonna see the best performance in comm mode. So how many comm servers can you run? One thing that you wanna evaluate is, you know, this goes along with what your server specs are. If you've got a quad core processor, then we recommend that you can run two comm servers per physical core. So if you have a quad core server, then you could run up to eight comm servers. Now we only recommend if you've also got the RAM, so the memory to back that up, having a gigabyte of RAM per comm server is a, a pretty ideal um, scenario. So, and that's gonna scale typically if you've got a quad core uh, machine, you're probably going to have eight gigs of RAM already. So uh, 16 is the maximum number that you can run. Um, most places are really not going to need this many. Um, especially when you're talking about having it run in a uh, load-based mode as opposed to a round-robin mode. It's going to just go to whatever comm server is available to serve up that requested web page. Um, but yes, yeah, so the general rule of thumb to recap is two comm servers per CPU core as long as you've got at least a gigabyte of RAM free per comm server as well. Okay, so antivirus and firewall. This one comes up uh, quite a bit and I'm not sure if it's just the antivirus software uh, undoing its exception lists or new versions get installed or versions get changed and then you guys don't get notified about it. But from time to time, this comes up um, and it's one of those things that should be really easy to prevent. So, the main things that you want to do are make sure that your entire ACE web folder and its subfolders are added to the uh, antivirus exception list. Obviously, the student manager folder needs to be added. That is where all of the files are going to be accessed. That's where you run the client program. So all of those definitely need to be, need to be added to your antivirus exception lists. You want to make sure that your web server has the correct uh, protocols open. So. Um, you know, port 80 for HTTP and 587 for HTTPS. Typically when you install the server role, the web server role, all of these ports are automatically opened and Windows says, okay, I need to talk to uh, my internal firewall. And because I'm a web server now, I'm gonna automatically open these up. This isn't always the case if you have an external firewall. So some of these bigger universities, you may have to make sure that you know, the route from your web server to the public has those necessary ports opened up. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is some payment gateways will also need specific IP addresses to be whitelisted. So you have to say, okay, expect traffic from this IP address and uh, everything will be good. What you don't want to happen is to have the thing that you rely on to be, you know, your safety blanket end up suffocating your registration opening. So make sure you get these uh, exceptions added and tested prior to that launch day. Okay, speaking of software, so we've talked about making sure that your hardware and your operating system are on fairly recent versions. Uh, even more important than that is your actual software that you're using. So do you have the latest security patches, um, Windows patches? Are you running the latest builds of Student Manager and AceWeb? Make sure that you perform these updates uh, sooner rather than later. Don't wait until the week before to say, okay, I think uh, we're getting close. Let's go ahead and update. We want to make sure that you've got time to test things out and make sure everything is working with the new builds before you go to that launch day. 
And we're going to do a shameless plug for the forums. So your ACE web forum and your student manager forum. So we can show you guys how you can get notified of when we do software releases. So I'm going to pop on over to the page here. And we're going to go aceware.com slash forum. So this is our form. And we can get to this. If we go back to our homepage, if we go to our aceware.com homepage, and you go under company, and you click Aceware Forums, this is going to take you right to the forms. If you haven't already created an account, uh, make sure you do that. And then depending on if you are on the SQL version or the Fox Pro version, you'll either use the Aceware updates or the Aceware SQL version updates. You just click into that form. And down at the very bottom, there will be a button that says, or a link that says subscribe forum. What that does is anytime we make a post about an ASWEB update that was released, you should get an email letting you know that that's occurred. If you come to the forum, and as you can see on mine here, it says unsubscribe, then there's nothing that you need to do. Uh, you are already subscribed to the forum. And then I'd recommend that you do the same thing for the student manager update. So it's this top one here. Uh, same deal applies. Just go and make sure that you are subscribed to that forum. Okay. Any questions so far? Doing good? Doing good. Awesome. So yes, software updates. Do um, you want to establish kind of the, the correct chain of command? You know, who do I need to talk to in IT? Um, who's my go-to person to organize getting these updates done? For some of the bigger universities, that can be tricky to get the right personnel involved with your ACEWARE technician so that they've got access to the server to be able to stop IIS, uh, and put your new update files in, get everything restarted, do some basic tests. Sometimes that's something that has to be scheduled you know, a ways in advance. So make sure that you do have that correct uh, action plan laid out. Okay, so debug logging, um, again, comes up time and time again, you know, is debug logging even worth it? Do I need to have it? Is it the, the cause of the slowness? There's, there's so many questions that we get surrounding debug logging. Um, I will never recommend that you completely disable logging. Uh, there is typically always going to be a, a nice balance of having the security of you know, your paper trail of what's occurring on AceWeb and with your payment gateway and still maintaining decent performance. So let's talk about some of the options that you can do. First up is file versus table. Up until a few years ago, I guess it's, gosh, it's probably been more than five or six years now, but we didn't have a method to store your debug log into a table. It was only done with files. So it would create uh, new files for um, each day and you would just get these huge text files and they would grow and grow and grow in size and it just wasn't the best for optimal performance. So I always recommend that you set your debug logging to table at the bare minimum. Um, SQL versus Visual Fox Pro. This is kind of compounded as well. So in SQL, it is stored into a table in your SQL database. So again, earlier we talked about you know, how many transactions is your web server doing? How many times does it have to read and write to files if you are on uh, the Fox Pro or the file-based version? Um, with debug logging, it's even more important. If, you're, if your web server is trying to write to files um, in a file-based logging system, as well as um, update and read files in your database, it's just compounding how much work it has to do uh, in that file-based mode. So having SQL definitely takes the win here, um, especially when you couple that using the table-based logging as opposed to file-based logging. Um, and so the last thing is, again, we talked about ways that you can still keep critical logging enabled, but without hampering your performance. And that is with the flag setting. So what you do, and this only works with the table method, but you set it to table, and then colon flags, and then you put in whatever uh, areas that you want to 
log. So typically, if you want just the bare minimum to keep you out of trouble with your students, then that's going to be everything with the pay service, PYSRV, and everything with pay. That's just going to be logging those critical things that give you the info that you need to look up a transaction like from your payment gateway to say, okay, what happened online? Why isn't this recorded in the database? Uh, that records that critical information so that you have that at your disposal. And to see a list of the flags that you can actually put, all you have to do is go into your, your debug, um, debug flag setting, and it will tell you all of the ones that you can use and exactly what they log. All right, so next up is doing that pre-opening testing. Um, you want to try and break it before your students do. That's the bottom line here. Don't wait until the opening day to find out that there is some critical thing that was overlooked or some setting that didn't get correctly set, and you have to wait until you start get, getting phone calls pouring in from angry students saying they can't register or they can't pay. Uh, make sure that you are you have an action plan in place to have your staff just beat on this for a while before you actually get to that opening day. Um, so we're going to talk about some tips that you can use when doing that. So instead of actually opening up a course and possibly having the public go and register for that, I want to make sure everyone knows about using that um, preview course URL link. So I'm going to log into my test here. And then let's look up an upcoming course of financial management. So let's say you just cloned this course and you wanna make sure that everything is looking good on AceWeb and that you can actually take a payment and have that post successfully to your payment gateway. And then the authorization information posts successfully back to your database, but you don't wanna open this course up to the public. Well, if you go to the course and student manager, you click on that AceWeb Info tab. Up here in the top right, you've got two links. There's a preview AceWeb course status page and the copy link to the course status page. They essentially do the same thing. One just copies the URL into your clipboard. The other one will open whatever your default browser that is set. I think mine is set to Edge. Um, but there's a couple of settings that come into play when using this. So let's go and look at those. So we're going to go into our preferences, edit preferences. And on this main system tab here, you can see the AceWeb URL. If you have some, if this is empty or it has something like Aceware University, which I think is our, our demo value for this, and you say every time I try and preview my courses, it, it goes up to your website and it says the course isn't there or is invalid. Double check that your AceWeb URL is actually set to whatever your true AceWeb URL is. So mine on my local installation here is just my IP address. And then you have to follow that up with a wconnect and a backslash. If you're going to be using the link that automatically opens up that course page, this is where you can set which browser you want to use. So like I said, mine is set to Edge right now, but you can set that to whichever you want. So we're going to go back in Financial Management, AceWeb Info, and we're going to say Preview. So you see a little kind of DOS window pop up, and then your browser pops up. And right now, we are on this course, but you can see in Student Manager, it is set to no publish register allow billing. Even if this was set to do not publish, we would still be able to view that course in the browser because we're using this special link, which puts this publish equals anyway value on the end of the URL. So at this point, we can enroll in this. We can log in with our test account. We can make sure that it gets added to the course or the cart fine, that the fees look good. You know, if you've got other things that are coming into play, like memberships, things like that, this is the critical stuff that needs to be tested before your opening day. We're going to say proceed to checkout. So we're on our final review page here. And then we're going to say, okay, everything looks good. Take me to my payment gateway. And for mine, it's just our simulated pay service. But for you, this may be taking you to your TouchNet page, Authorize.net, PayPal, whichever one you use. You want to make sure that it is live. It's not set in a test mode. 
You want to make sure that all of your form fields that come up on the Gateway site are relevant. Obviously, you don't need to be collecting email addresses or addresses, shipping addresses, anything like that. All of that information is carried through, or all of the relevant information, I should say, is carried through when your student leaves ACEWeb. So they enter their card information and they submit it. The final step, or actually the second to last step, is to make sure that the successful transaction completed uh, confirmation page displays and also that you get the registration confirmation email. Make sure all of these pieces to this entire puzzle are fitting together at the very end. The last thing that you want to double check is actually in Student Manager. Maybe you get transaction completed here, but you come back into Student Manager and there's just nothing in the course. Um, obviously, that's a problem that would need to be looked at. So when I say from start to finish, I truly mean with a full course, make sure that you can, you know, put money in on your payment gateway side, make sure that you can check that on your payment gateway batch logging, make sure the transaction shows there, make sure the money is going into the right account. Um, you don't want to have to do this stuff during that hectic opening registration rush. So you can see we'll go into our payment here. If you go into the uh, pay details, we can see we've got our authorization number. So this would obviously be something from your payment gateway, but everything looks good here. So we'll call that a successful test. The key takeaway is make sure that works ahead of time as opposed to um, when it's crunch time. All right. So we verified that the successful payment information got posted. We showed you how to use that preview course status link. Um, one of the other things is to let your tech know. You know, let us know what your opening day is going to be. Make sure that we are going to be available and on call. Um, if, like I say, if, if something happens and there is just something that, uh, that got overlooked, um, it's better to have us aware of it and ready to address the situation as opposed to you waiting to see, you know, or get a call from your student and then trying to call Aceware or emailing your tech. You know, just make sure we're aware of it and having, having us on standby is just good practice. Okay, so before we get into the, the course and the catalog review, are we still doing good on questions? You're still doing great. Awesome. Okay, some tips on cloning. Term-specific info. So when I say term-specific info, uh, I'm going to kind of get on my soapbox here because I still see this a lot. And um, to get the most out of student manager, when you're entering your course and your catalog information, the way that we designed it is so that your course is the who, where, and when. This is where your, your dates and your times of your classes, the location, where it's going to happen, uh, the instructor, who's going to be teaching it, where all of these variables should go. And I say variables because those are the things that are going to change the next time you run the course. Um, it's going to have a different date. It may have a different instructor. All of those different things change. So those should be the ones left out of your catalog. The catalog is the information about the what and the why. What are you going to be learning? Uh, why should I take this course? This is the, the core description of what is being offered to your student. If you follow this structure and you keep term and date and time and location information out of your catalog, that makes it super easy to clone your courses, use the same catalog, and then have a nice flow without having to constantly edit your catalog information. Um, that being said, I know that there's a lot of different scenarios and people do this a lot of different ways. So um, the main thing that I want to convey is double check that when you're cloning, all of the relevant information that you want presented to your students is actually what's getting cloned. Okay, and then... The other thing, okay, this is this is on catalogs. So, uh, your primary and your secondary descriptions. So, your catalog record has two descriptions, and this was originally intended to be used if you have a print catalog or you send to a publishing company. They are just going to want the the basic text. They don't want any HTML 
coding or markup in the thing that you send to them because they're going to be running it through some sort of an algorithm that you know sticks it in a catalog or a brochure. Uh, so this gives you two options for having a description that is available to the public that you can mark up with whatever HTML you want, and then a separate one that is just the plain text description that will go to your catalog printing. So make sure that you double check both of those. If there is anything in the secondary description, that will always be what's used on ACEWeb. However, if it's blank, then whatever is in the primary description is what will be used. Even if there's no HTML markup, it's just going to put it in there as plain text and use your uh, system generated styles through ACEWeb. You also want to make sure that publish on web checkbox is checked. If that's not checked, then these courses aren't going to be showing up. Um, or these descriptions are not going to be showing up, your courses are not going to be showing up, so you want to make sure that that is enabled. So beyond course and catalog, have any of your fees changed? Are they all still relevant? Was there any pricing changes from the prior year or the prior semester? Um, if you have membership um, level fees, are those still the same? Are they getting the same type of discount? Did you have any term specific or seasonal coupons that were uh, on the course? Do those need to be updated or removed? You wanna check your optional fees. And then obviously is the location still correct? So again, these are all different things that can be cloned, not necessarily all of them get cloned by default. A lot of these are hidden behind some of your preferences. So you can kind of pick and choose what actually gets cloned and what doesn't get cloned. Uh, but these are going to be the ones that you definitely want to check when you're doing your cloning. Um, so specifically on location, something that uh, was pretty common in the past was to, and then especially at the beginning of the pandemic, was to have your Zoom link as a uh, part of the location information. So your location name would be online class. So, you know, for your hybrid and your online classes, you'd have this dummy location. And then in the information section, it would have the actual Zoom link. Well, that obviously represents a problem because you have to have a unique location for every course because the Zoom URL is typically going to be different for each one. So we, we heard your cries for help and we did put in a new URL fields on the course screen. I believe it's on the additional info tab. And that is where you can store, you know, that unique Zoom meeting link or online meeting link as opposed to having it in the location. And then finally, double check if you are cloning your instructor information that all of that information is relevant. I know one of the preferences for instructor cloning is uh, to clone like the pay note information. So is their pay still gonna be the same? Uh, all of that stuff is definitely critical material that you wanna check when you're cloning your courses. Now this is doubly important for places that have multiple people that are doing the course creation. So maybe you've got multiple staff members or you've got different departments that are all entering courses. Um, is to enable conflict checking. So this, again, is a preference. It's a user-specific preference because you can see it's in black text there. But you enable this preference. And then on the course screen, if you click the room use button, after you've got your course begin date and number of sessions and all of that information, uh, location specifically set in there, and you click room use, it's going to build that room use schedule. And then it's going to tell you if there's any conflicts. And so when we say conflict, we're basically talking about you've booked this same location on this same date and time um, for another course. And so obviously that would be a lot of confused students and probably instructors if you don't have anyone doing your conflict checking. So uh, this is the, the way to do it as you're adding the course. Um, obviously that isn't convenient if you wanna just check all conflicts at once. So we do have a function that you could use on reports. And I I want to say it's on a report somewhere, probably in the room use reporting area, that will show you any of your uh, room use conflicts. So keep that in mind and definitely do that as a, a final check. All right, so next up we've got the publish dates. This is a, uh, it's a fairly recent feature that we put in that will allow you to set a specific date that your ACEWeb publish property goes live.
So in essence, if there is something in that published date field and it is not in the past, then it is going to wait to set the published property that's selected until that date. Now you can set this on an individual basis. So if you have a lot of courses that are gonna be uh, popping in at different uh, dates that you wanna have them go live, you can do that on a course by course basis, but you can also use that mass change tool. So module courses, mass change, update, delete, and you can change that publish web, excuse me, web publish register status and set it to whichever one you want and then put in your publish date. So again, if you're one of the places where everything is going to go live on a specific date, then this is the tool for you because that's going to um, allow you to pre-set up those courses to go live at your specified publish settings. So whether that is publish register or publish register allow billing, uh, you can have it do that all at once. So very handy tool. Okay, so the final checks. Uh, this is one that I, I always hear time and time again. My course isn't showing up on AceWeb. I did all the things and it's still not working. What the heck? Is there a bug in the program? Well, let's talk about all the things. So what are the criteria for a course to show on AceWeb? So right off the bat, it has to be active. If it's not active, there is no other combination of settings or URL parameters that you can use that will allow this course to show on AceWeb. The course begin date has to be on or after the current date. Now this behavior can obviously be modified by the lag day setting. So if you have a positive lag day setting, then the course will stay online visible and open for registration that number of days after the course begin date. If you put in a negative date there, then that course is gonna fall off of AceWeb that many days before the course begin date. So if you don't want any latecomers, let's say your instructor needs extra time to prepare or to send out materials to the students, then you might use a negative lag day there. Now, the one place that this differs is with your online course types. Online course types should not use begin and end dates because they are not, um, they are not meeting at that specific date and time. They are something that opens enrollment on a specific date. So for your online course types, when you change that course type from open or whatever to online, a new field will pop up and it says, enrollment opens, or maybe called date open for enrollment, depending on your uh, version. That is the date that that course is available to register online, and that should be the one that you use. I have seen people get kind of crafty with using begin dates and end dates, as well as the enrollment opens date, so that the course shows up in different areas. But just keep in mind that can lead to some kind of confusing behavior if those dates um, you know, reach a certain point to where it'll show that it's available, but then you click on it and it says registration is not available at this time. So it can be kind of misleading to your students. All right, if as most of you do, use some form of grouping on AceWeb. So if you have single level grouping or dual level grouping, your course has to have at least one grouping code. Otherwise it's not gonna show up under any of your groups. Now it should still show in the all courses link, but um, typically people are not gonna be using the, you know, view all courses to find what they're looking for. They're gonna be using the groups that you had set up beforehand. And obviously we just talked about this, but the AceWeb published property has to be set to some form of publish. If it's no publish register or it's just no publish, it's not gonna show up on AceWeb. So again, double check your publish property and that it is set to some form of publish. And then if you don't want the course to show up as being full, then your course maximum needs to be a non-zero amount and it has to be greater than the number of students already enrolled in the class. Otherwise it is gonna display as being full um, in those show schedule listings. That is that. Those are the basics of getting everything showing on AceWeb and getting your server and softwares tuned in. Um, at this time, we've got plenty of time for questions. So if you've got some, let's hear them.
Great. As they are thinking about those questions, for those that might be listening on demand um, earlier in this session, if you would like Aceware to talk to your IT about hardware, the hardware recommendations Jason made, certainly we're glad to sit in and do that. Um, just give us a call and we're glad to talk to your IT representatives. <laughs> 